We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. The internet gives us access not only to information, but also to each other. And the more that we can give fuel to the possibility of connection, the better off we'll be. From Offscript Media, I am Matthew Zachary, and this is Out of Patience. On today's show, my good friend, longtime partner in crime, and Princess Leia Jedi Master of Health Tech, Susanna Fox, whom I consider to be one of the most insightful, introspective, and influential unicorn renaissance human beings around. Her passion has been, and quite possibly forever shall be, the fundamental premise of peer-to-peer health. You know, that whole you're not alone thing, connecting with people with shared and similar experiences where there's no judgments and no stigma and you feel like you belong. This is tribalism done right for the purpose of life hacking your way around whatever shit happens store you happen to be shopping in. That's Susanna's passion. See if you can spot the gestalt moment in the episode where I nearly lost my mind in the best sense after hearing that, of all places, the thrush of modern-day health life hackery is coming from Amazon Reviews. On that note, enjoy my conversation with Susanna Fox. Susanna Fox, welcome to Out of Patience. You and I have an incredible history together going back I don't know, 14, 15 years you were at Pew Research. For our listeners, this was back in the Stone Age of when the words health 2.0 became letters and numbers you put together at the same time. It meant nothing at the time, but it started this idea that maybe the internet, the interweb, whatever we called it back then, had a place and a purpose in health. So it's been a hell of a ride these God knows how many 14 years or so to get to where we are. And, you know, you've been both a fly on the wall and chairman of the board of the health tech industry. Like you're like Yoda or Yodette or like whatever the gender neutral version of Yoda is in health tech. Uh, Princess Leia. Princess Leia. I'll take that. You're the Princess Leia. Yeah, because technically she's a Jedi now. So, yes, we're agreeing that you are the Princess Leia master Jedi of health tech. And it's just amazing to come full circle and see how we I went the nonprofit way. You went the private sector way. And. You have such incredible insights nearly every day on Twitter and your blog on this idea of peer-to-peer, which has always kind of been this disposable semantic that kind of lived on in the nonprofit sector about not being alone and finding your decisions and meeting people like you. But it's become a real thing now. And I just wanted to start the conversation by, A, thanking you for doing what you do and being who you are, but really focusing on the one thing that we really haven't gotten right, that you're so astutely, acutely aware of ideating on. Go forth. Thank you. And I want to go back to when we met those many years ago when dinosaurs roamed the internet. You were actually engaging in peer-to-peer healthcare. I had not yet even started calling it that. Nobody was. And what you were creating was a way for young people with cancer to connect to each other because nobody else was doing it. You guys were stumbling around in the dark, wondering if anybody else out there was also a young person with cancer. And you, Matthew said, you know what? 
I'm sick of this. I need to change this. And you took action. And that was such a beautiful thing that technology allowed you to do. What if you didn't have the internet when you started Stupid Cancer? Like, what, what would you have done? A uh, carrier pigeon, maybe? I don't quite know. <laughs> it really was when dinosaurs roamed the internet. We, we launched when MySpace was a thing. So Obama hadn't yet done his uh, Facebook reveal for his campaign in those seven. Like, we didn't even know what that was. And you're right. The, the idea of finding someone like you to get information from, but maybe not doctor level information from, unless, of course, they were a doctor, was a fabulous new concept in the early 2000s. And it stemmed from this idea that specifically cancer was a now a chronic disease and that the, you know, we use mental health today, but back then it was called survivorship. Your quality of life was tantamount to your quality of care. So the idea of meeting your tribe, you know, it wasn't a new idea because of like AA and other support groups, but in cancer, it never really coalesced the way it did. And again, like we were both there at the right place at the right time to see the coalescence of technology and peer support. And again, like something that I am digging into these days is the history of peer to peer, because I know that we both, we all of us stand on the shoulders of giants. And just because something has 2.0 after it, or just because something is now digital doesn't mean that it's wholly new. And I think that cancer is a really good example of something that was really quite rare and pretty taboo. And so you had this combination of something that you didn't want to talk about. And if you did talk about it, and I'm talking historically, like, right. you know, for most of the 20th century, if you did talk about it, you probably weren't going to find anybody in your friend group who was also in their 20s dealing with, let's say, brain cancer. Right. And so, but what's really neat is that we're standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of the peer-to-peer -peer healthcare that, of course, has been going on for millennia. And you named one famous group, you know, started in the 1930s by two men who wanted to find a way out of their alcohol addiction. And they found that talking with each other and finding community and creating community was, was a way. You know, you think about Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers is the same kind of thing. I'm really intrigued by the um, promotoras that are used in Latino communities that create these conversations that maybe wouldn't otherwise happen that brings health and science into their communities. This has been going on forever and ever and ever, but now because of technology, things that are pretty rare, you can find your people. And that is what I am obsessed with. Right. Be because it's not being leveraged. It's still something that's seen as on the margin. It's seen as something that maybe the marketing department at a hospital should be involved in. It's, it's seen as like pink ribbons and breast cancer walks. And I'm like, no, this is actually a problem solving tool for business leaders and policymakers. And that's what I'm all about these days. I've always felt like, you know, if we really want to go back to the early days when before Google, before the internet, like you had to go to the library to figure out what was wrong with you. And maybe you met someone at the library. But in the early 2000s, you know, when Google started to become a thing and PubMed started to exist and the MIT list service started to happen, I mean, Google it, kids, really old shit, you know, is <laughs> you, you would bring paperwork to your doctor's office and they'd like shun it. And this pro and con hashtag Dr. Google became anathema to any sort of progress. It was like this brick wall. If you search Google, you're fucked. Or don't go to Dr. Google. But now there's other things that aren't Dr. Google because Google isn't peer support. But you could find peer support on Dr. Google. What's your perception of the receptivities in the HCP and the leadership world on the value of bringing something to your doctor that you found through peer support? There's been a sea change. Really? In the last, yeah, in the last 15 years. 
and um, of course it has to be qualified. What I have seen is a very different conversation now among clinicians. When back in the year like 2001, when I had one of the luckiest breaks of my career was getting to work with Tom Ferguson, who was a trained MD, who in the 1970s and 80s, he wanted to create uh, the equivalent of driver's ed for your health and really believed in peer support and, and educating people about their bodies. And when we started working together, he told me that doctors, his colleagues had a hand signal for a patient who uses the internet. <laughs> and you can't see me, but imagine that I'm holding my right hand palm down right at chest level and my left hand palm up right at like belly button level. And it basically like if a patient came in who was using the internet and, and printing out lots of journal articles, a doctor would leave that exam room and maybe run into a colleague in the hall and make this hand signal so that the patient can see. And that it's a stack of papers. They're doing like a sign for stack of papers. Like they're miming papers. a stack of papers? Yeah. Okay. Miming a stack of papers and roll their eyes. Oh, and so God. that was like 2001, you know, era. And in a lot of ways, that reflects the moment. It reflects the time when we had we had really reached a pinnacle of the expansion of medical literature. The medical literature and journal industry exploded in the last half of the 20th century. And those medical libraries and medical journals were, were frankly kind of locked up. They were, you know, you had to have credentials to get into those places until the internet came along and started opening those up. And doctors really didn't like it. They didn't have a culture where it was okay for a patient to be questioning them. The sea change has come about because, um, and I would say it's especially in specialist areas. So if a patient comes in educated about their type of cancer or educated about the, the rare condition that their child has, a specialist is more likely to be welcoming because that patient, that family is starting, you know, three squares ahead or 10 squares ahead of a family that doesn't have any background whatsoever, doesn't even know what, what they're there for. So I would say that, that specialists have become more open to this. Uh, because they see the benefit. And that's really the key to so much of this. If somebody doesn't see the benefit of what you're bringing to them, then they're never going to be welcoming to you because you're just wasting their time. And we see that in so many ways, right? Well, it is the autocratic, you know, paternalistic nature of medicine to, you know, I didn't go to evil medical school to become Mr. Evil. Like I went to medical school to become a doctor. And it's pleasing to hear that the receptivity is changing. Do you think then that that could possibly trickle into the peer-to-peer -peer between doctors? Have you seen influence trending from one doctor to others in specialties or not? Like, hey, guys, I'm happy when my patients do the right research or do some research, and I'm willing to almost be more of a customer service welcoming person, thanking them for being proactive rather than dismissing them. Is there a, is again, I'm just using peer to peer from like professional to professional. Does that exist? I've seen it talked about. For example, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement is a place where learning health networks among clinicians are championed. And learning health networks are a way, um, you know, for example, a, a famous one is the cystic fibrosis learning network, where because of the data sharing and the treatment um, success sharing that, that went on throughout the late 20th century, um, the median age for people with cystic fibrosis rose by, you know, 30 years. Because if you, you know, if you do these treatments, the research shows, all of the data shows that you, your child, and now young adults and, and even adults into their 50s, will live longer. 
What's key, though, is the movement, which is much younger, of including patients and caregivers in those learning health networks. Again, we're starting to see it to some degree in cystic fibrosis. We're starting to see it in um, the management of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. We're starting to see it in IBD and ulcerative colitis, especially among kids, because there's an acknowledgement that a lot of these conditions are not just about taking a certain drug at a certain time of day. It's about knowing what foods that person can tolerate and, and likes so, so that they can gain weight. It's about you know all the home care that a clinician doesn't have anything to do with. And so how might we tap into the incredible wealth of knowledge that patients and caregivers have about home care and infuse that into the learning health networks that the clinicians are really coming to respect. That's what I'm really interested in, in helping to create in the world. Back with our guest after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. I'm going to use the word life hack because that to me sums up how we learn to do the things that we didn't expect to have to do when you enter, you know, the shit happens store of cystic fibrosis or sarcoma or type 1 diabetes. There's no demand for that economy. There's only supply for that economy. I've been mm-hmm. saying this for years. No one wants to go. I can't wait to get diabetes. I can't wait to get you know brain cancer. You walk into the store and there are no greeters, rhetorical greeters. So traditionally, you know, with the internet, let's just go back at least maybe 20 years, you could ideally maybe find a nonprofit organization or something that could connect you to someone or something. And I'm going to just go in the cancer world. Traditionally, that's how it all began. And they weren't necessarily going to these groups or coming to our meetups or coming to the stupid cancer conferences or the cancer and work events. I mean, they were there to learn practical things. But when they talked to someone else, like, how did you deal with your hydrocephaly? Where did you go for your lymphedema sleeve? Right. Like, where Mm -hmm. did you like what are the life hacks that you had? How did you manage to talk to your kids? And then the evolution of like books and content and and original peer-driven content on how I got through this. I'm thinking of like, you you said the value of peer-to-peer and CF produced higher quality of life and longer lives. That's quantified. Are we looking at like how the nonprofit sector kind of, I almost say like validated or gave credence to how life hacks can extend and ideally maybe cost the system less money? I think it's still not yet recognized in most C-suites. I think that when someone is diagnosed, if they are tuned in to the possibility of peer-to-peer healthcare, whatever they call it, if they're tuned into the idea that there's probably some information that I could use. So I'm going to go onto, these days, people go onto Facebook and they say, where can I find a, another group of people like me? Or, frankly, I see a lot of peer-to-peer healthcare happening in Amazon reviews. Really? So you go on, oh yeah, so you go into Amazon reviews for a certain, a certain product that people need, you know, for, for a certain health condition or physical challenge. And you'll see in the comments, you know, in the reviews, what works and what doesn't. You'll also see it in books. 
books about a certain health condition, peer-to-peer healthcare will break out in the reviews. Right, that's amazing. And yeah, and and that's one of the signs of hope for me that this is becoming so grassroots obvious that people are just stumbling on it, um, and it's becoming part of our culture. Just like you wouldn't buy a car without you know doing some research about it. You wouldn't send your kid to a school without doing some research about it. You expect now to be able to access data, you know, quantitative data about something that you're going to, you know, buy or engage in. And even more so, we're starting to expect to be able to get these peer reviews. But yet that grassroots expectation is unfortunately not yet really talked about the way the way I think it needs to be in the C-suite. And let me give you an example. And, and this is where I started to think about peer-to-peer healthcare. I, <laughs> what I found is that when I was trying to explain it to policymakers, when I was trying to explain it to CEOs, I was getting all tangled up in, you know, well, what is the difference between you know, what happens at at a Weight Watchers meeting versus what happens at, you know, in a learning health network. Right. And so I created these, these stages. So, so bear with me. Stage zero is when you're alone. You are totally alone. You think you're the only one. Maybe you have some shame around the condition that you've just been diagnosed with. Maybe it's pretty rare, but you're, you're totally alone. Stage one of peer-to-peer healthcare is when you find your people. (laughs) You, you know, you create that connection. And I don't know if you listen or have read anything by Brene Brown. Oh, yeah. She talks about when you find your people, there's the possibility of knowing laughter and the importance (laughs) of knowing laughter. Like, oh, you know, did that happen to you? That totally happened to me. Like, don't worry about it. And that is so healing to people. But that's just stage one. Like, that's just making you feel better that you're not alone. That's gestalt. It's gestalt, exactly. And it's so important. And by the way, a lot of people stop there. Like, if that's all you need to know that you're not alone, okay, that's cool. Right. The next step, though, is when people start to solve a problem. When somebody says, hey, um, I've got an idea or I created this device for my kid, or, hey, I've been trying this new diet and it's really working for, for this type of you know, condition that we have. Why don't we all test it? That's stage two. Stage two is when there's small group innovation. But it's still really niche. Like It's something that is not yet on the radar screen of, of anybody who has any resources in healthcare. Right. Stage three is when somebody with resources takes notice. And those resources can be media attention. It could be actual funding to, you know, do a clinical trial or to say, like, let's take this thing that you've built out of popsicle sticks and duct tape and bring it into this testing lab and we'll um, help you get a patent on it. You know, that's the whole maker movement you know, the, the idea that these maker spaces would give people industrial strength tools to see if their assistive device, you know, for somebody living with a physical challenge could actually be made at scale. And that's stage three of peer-to-peer healthcare, when, when resources are infused into an innovation. And stage four is when that innovation is disseminated broadly. And that's the cycle that we need to recognize, first of all, and give fuel to. Like we need to give fuel to the peer-to-peer healthcare that's happening at each of those stages. But right now, most people are really only talking about stage one. Well, I mean, (laughs) this is going to be an odd black humor joke, but in cancer, stage one is the best. So, but in your case, stage four is the best. (laughs) Maybe we think about nomenclature and the oncology. I'm totally kidding. I would love that. No, but you're right. And, and, and by the way, like sometimes there's no possibility of patients peer to peer 
coming up with a new cancer drug. Like that's not appropriate. Right. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Yes. Let, let me put on my, I mean, I've been in the private sector all of six months and I'm nowhere near like a C-suite in the space that you operate, but is there any kind of elfin magical algorithmic, you know, economic chart that would help them rationalize, you know, profit and purpose at the same time where peer-to-peer -peer data improves morale and improve shareholder value and improve, you know, can you do well and do good at the same time? What's that data look like? Is, is there one little trigger that does that? What I like to do is when I'm, when I'm talking with a healthcare leader, basically often what happens is, is that I get hired to work on a health data project and which is another, you know, stream of work that I do. And I love health data and, and all of that is, is really exciting to me, but I'll finish that project. And after I present that, I will just say, hey, if you have an extra 15 minutes, let me just tell you about this, this other piece of my work. And, and I tell them about peer-to-peer -peer healthcare. Right. And what I do is I say, tell me a significant business problem that you're having. Tell me in your population, for example, like what is, what's really costing you a lot of money these days? And so, for example, people not taking the drugs that they've been prescribed is a huge cost in the healthcare Compliance. system. Compliance. Compliance or adherence, yes. Good old stories, yes. Yes, um, and so, well, gosh, well, well, what can we do about that? There's, there's some mechanisms, you know, so PillPack is an incredible innovation that is now owned by Amazon that makes it easy for someone maybe with some cognitive challenges to stay on top of their complicated drug regimen. And if you don't know pill pack, it's, it's super cool. You basically like pull out a bubble for each time of day. Like if you've got morning meds and evening meds, it, it comes in a different little um, bubble pack. And so what's great about that is that it just is totally clear. Like if you take these three meds in the morning and these four meds in the evening, it's, it's there for you. Okay, that's great. But what about the person who actually just doesn't like taking their meds? <laughs> They're not convinced <laughs> that it's good for them to take all these meds. Well, another lecture from their nurse or doctor, <laughs> it turns out once a year getting lectured isn't the intervention that we need. That no, is not certainly been not. Shown. <laughs> There's no school marming of the take your medicine. So what has been shown to have a really positive effect on medication adherence is um, understanding why you're taking the meds. And, and that can happen through peer-to-peer -peer connection. That can happen through connection to another group of people who have the same condition that you do, who take the same meds that you do, who say, okay, Tell me why you don't like taking that drug. Well, it means that I get up in the middle of the night and pee because it's a diuretic. Okay, well, you know what? Talk to your doctor because I switched that drug to the morning. Or another thing that I've heard about is um, injection parties, basically, where if you have to do a daily injection and you hate it, you actually log on to a site where everybody is there for like that. 10 minutes of that, you know, you all log on it. And they all inject PM. themselves at the same time. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, and it's, you just it's terrifying, like but amazing. Your, <laughs> right. You just cheer yourself on like, okay, everybody's going to do it. Like, this is important. This is good for our health. Let's do it. And it's like um, group cliff and, diving in the, in the Maldives or something. Yes. Yes. And, and what's beautiful is that there of course have been anecdotal stories about this for years and years. But now we're starting to build up a literature about it. People have done trials and, and looked at this as an effect. And that's what we need to bring to people to say, creating a peer-to-peer -peer group for, among the people that um, are really having trouble taking their meds. Again, this is not just a hugs group. <laughs> right, right. This is life hacks in real time. Yes. It's astonishing. So, you know, the progress is not a straight line or whatever the moral arc of the universe quote. So you're demonstrably seeing, and you mentioned sea change, but it's for real. You're actually seeing this happen in real time. 
I, I want to continue this conversation in, in eternity with you, but what's a good takeaway for our listeners to have a little more optimism in this system? Like, the, I feel like this is, we, we joke about like the democratization of healthcare, you know, as like mm-hmm. this air quote thing. Is this it in real action? And are we looking to be more optimistic that maybe one day there'll be enough quantifiable data that these life hacks improve compliance and save the system money and help people live better at the same time? What I like to say to people is just to keep in mind that the internet gives us access not only to information, but also to each other. And the more that we can give fuel to the possibility of connection, the better off we'll be, especially if we pair that with increased access to information, data, and tools. Because there is a downside I don't want to be Pollyanna. I don't want to say that peer-to-peer is, has only an upside. There are downsides to people connecting and spreading misinformation. Like drinking bleach. <laughs> I had to go there. Yes. I'm sorry. I just had to go there. <laughs> but what, again, what we have seen in academic studies looking at dissemination of information is that if you give people access to the right information, to science, to good information, they are likely to listen to it. People want to do the right thing. They, they want to make sure that their kids, for example, are going to live and thrive. And people are likely to listen to their pediatrician if we can back that up with science so that the peer-to-peer networks are also infused with science. So the more we can open up access to information, data, and tools, the better. Just incredible data and science and and not even wonky. Like we're talking regular human language. The idea that tribalism can work for the right reasons when done the right way. This is exactly where I'm thrilled. Like all these years later, you know, I was, I was stage one, like your stage one, not cancer stage one (laughs) for like seven years. I was alone, but now here we are 25 years later and this is, marked progress that I'm just thrilled to share with our listeners. Uh, Susanna Fox, uh, I, I just love your, your, your byline is, I help people navigate health and tech. But really, we've agreed you are the Princess Leia Jedi Master of Health Tech and uh, the, the queen of peer-to-peer data. I should also just mention this will be in, in, in the descriptions, but you kind of ran health and human services at the chief tech officer. That's a, that's a big thing to do. To Finally. stop you. No, what? I, I cannot let you get away with that because I ran an innovation lab as the, as the CTO at HHS. Huge honor, but in no way did I run HHS. <laughs> I will button that with an asterisk. How's that? Thank but you, you know, you Thank still you. deserve all the praise uh, that you you've earned, and it's been you know just knowing you for so long and having this dual career arc with you has been phenomenal. So thanks for coming on. Hopefully, you know the first of many uh, shows with me. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Jen Horanjeff and Andrew McDowell. Darren Tun is our production intern. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Matthew Zachary. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make guest recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com.